Good evening, everybody, from um, the RTS, Royal Television Society. My name is Caroline Frost. I'm an entertainment journalist, and I am delighted to be joined tonight by the uh, communal talents of Simon Blackwell, writer of Back, David Mitchell, who plays Stephen, and Robert Webb, who plays Andy. They are on the um, brink of appearing on our screens with series two and this is a chance to talk about the making the motivations and all of that's what's been going on behind the scenes because obviously like everyone else in the world they've had to deal with timing issues as well as everything else so let's take you back to the beginning and we'll start with you simon if i may mm. um what was the inspiration for back where did it where did it take hold of you what was the acorn that was sown um well i'd been asked uh by channel four via big talk to uh if I could come up with some sitcom ideas for David and Robert to star in post peep show I think this was when I, the, they were either making the last uh series of peep show or or it was going out and um and so I went away and I I think I came up with a bunch of ideas although I have no um record of any of the other ones so maybe I just came up with one idea but um I liked I I liked the uh I like the premise of having a, a foster brother come back. It all, it's actually all born out of that initial, uh, the scene at the end of, of part one in, in series one, where David's saying, uh, David's character, Stephen is saying goodbye to his late father at the graveside or trying to. And then Andrew steps into frame and says, um, goodbye, dad. And, and tells Stephen that he's his brother and Stephen has no recollection of that at all. And I thought that's, that's a good place to start. That's a, you immediately want to know what's, what's happening then. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I just, I liked the dynamic of it. I liked, um, I liked the, I could see David and Robert it, uh, playing those characters. And um, it's, it seemed like a good setup. It seemed like it would draw you in. I think mm -hmm. that was the main thing. I mean, certainly when you pitch it like that, that's like a, a 19th century Victorian novel, isn't it? The returning person at the graveside that has very dramatic Gothic implications. Yeah. I mean, I always try, you know, my, I always like to make whatever I write work as a drama. If you stripped all of the jokes out, that it would still be, it would still work. The emotional beats would work if it were a drama, because I think you need to engage people in the story with a sitcom as much as you do with any drama. So um, that seemed engaging and I, I liked it. And then we just, we, we, we talked it through. We had a lot of, you know, meetings and lunches and just chatted through the kind of, you know, what the themes might be. And, um, and it's, it seemed to have legs. So we, we carried on with it. Okay, that's great. Let's just set up the scene, if you will, with the, the pair of you actors as well, the stars of the show. So let's start. I mean, for me, it's a little bit like the prodigal son as well. It's the parable of the hardworking, sort of slightly downtrodden, underappreciated homestayer and who is whose life is disrupted by the glamorous and disruptive arrival of, as you say, this new person on the block. So let's start with the person who is at home. Um, David, did you always know you were going to play it this way around, that it was up to you to play that slightly downtrodden Stephen, or did you pitch for the other one? No, I think so. No, there was no, there was no uh, <laughs> pitching for one or the other. I think it was pretty def definite which way around it was going to be. And, and I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm very comfortable playing, the, you know, I'm, I am the, I like to play the comic mattress on which people jump up and down. So, you know, that's, that's the, you know, there's, 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 um, there's a lot of comedy and a lot of fun acting to be had mm -hmm. from the character that things are happening to. How would you describe Stephen? Uh, I, as disappointed and <laughs> self-loathing <laughs> and self endlessly self-doubting, mm -hmm. but also uh, intelligent and a little bit angry. Uh, so, I, I, yeah. Okay. So, you know, yes. And did he was I, he informed? I threaten itself. Oh. <laughs> so was he informed by anybody you knew? Were there any any go tos for inspiration? A, a school teacher? Something that's you know somebody with brown corduroy trousers, isn't he? Um, no, I mean I'm I'm a very um, that, that's not the how that's not how I do acting. 
Um, I don't really I think, I mean, I, I would say his, his uh, appearance, his, what he looked like, what he sounded like, that was inspired by me. Um, that was what I already looked and sounded like. Um, and so that was convenient to remain like that. Um, and they gave me other clothes to wear that some people have been good enough to say are sometimes distinguishable from the sort of things I wear anyway. So that was that's the, the main uh, inspiration. I think my, you know, I would say I feel my job in a role like that. And obviously that's the same as Mark in uh, Peep Show and slightly mm -hmm. different from playing Shakespeare in Upstart Crow. The main thing is you're, you're, you have to make the situation that you are plunged into seem like it might really be happening. Uh, and in a way that is amusing. Uh, so, so it's so I didn't I you know I'm, I'm not going to claim for a moment to have thought well yes I saw this I, I got the walk from my old geography teacher and I got, <laughs> got the, the look of uh, despair from a homeless man in a doorway I know it's just, None of that. None I, just of that. I said the words like I thought people might say them if if, <laughs> if it was really happening which it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> well it sounds good it was like a camera a microphone, you know, is so this to me this feels so fake, but then it's great because they frame out all that fake stuff, and so there you are in the middle of it. And so if you don't look fake, people on some level buy into it. That's, that's Definitely the Laurence Olivier school rather than the Dustin <laughs> Hoffman. <did you? laughs> but yes, I mean, I, I th I'm not sure Dustin Hoffman transformative method. Uh, Laurence Olivier, why don't you just act? David Mitchell, why don't you just read it out? <laughs> <laughs> the next one beyond um and tell us robert so this i'm guessing by default that meant you were left with the slightly sexier slightly more enigmatic slightly more appealing to the fairer sex character of andy was this something that you felt was uh, the the writer of the two the two characters you thought you could fit into that costume if, if pushed well i mean of the two that's i mean yeah because sexy isn't funny and neither is uh, <laughs> neither is smooth or intelligent <laughs> or plausible so um so no i wouldn't have if, if it had been a pitch i would certainly have wanted to play uh, steven but anyway i'm fine uh, i'm not complaining right. um, no it's a, it was it was i think simon had us in mind to play those two characters that way around and um, the same as sam and jesse uh, when it came to peep show um we tried david, david and i try not to look into it too deeply as to what it is about our personalities that makes writers come up with people like this for us to play but um uh, no it was nice because it was you know andrew's a liar um in the same way that and so was jeremy but jeremy was an idiot whereas andrew is a better liar uh, mm -hmm. and so it was it's kind of more fun to play someone who, I mean, he, he kind of walks into a room, certainly in series one, as if he's famous. He kind of thinks he's the, it's like the Fonz has turned up and, you know, he's kind of expecting a, a round of applause. And, and in series one, apart from Stephen, that's pretty much what he got. They all thought he was amazing and he gets to modestly just go, guys, come on, it's just, it's just little old me for Pete's sake. <laughs> and it's that kind of uh, character. Um, so, but he, you know, it was also interesting because he, he clearly has some kind of massive problem with uh, with Stephen in particular, and more generally, you know, he just goes around telling these whoppers. Um, so he, he's either this very very needy person who uh, is desperate for so desperate for approval that he will he will say potentially quite dangerous things, or he's an absolute maniac. And I never really decided during the season one series one or or two. I'm not sure if Simon's decided. Certainly the character doesn't know. <laughs> so I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't think Andrew particularly knows what he's doing, um, but he's sort, of, he's sort of, it's like Blair, he kind of believes it while he's saying it. Uh, and he could probably make a pretty good case for why he said it, but it just wouldn't necessarily be true. What was it like um, coming back together on screen, obviously having had such a huge success with Peep Show and both gone away and had some very successful solo projects. Was it like pulling on a pair of lovely slippers and uh, getting on the familiar bike to ride or was it um, slightly different coming back this time around and discovering fresh things about each other? Well, I, th I think it, there's an element of it that, I mean, both, um, in, both for, for the first series and the second series, there's an element of it that it is comfortable because Rob and I have, we've, 
acted opposite each other for so long that there's definitely there's that we're um, we're very comfortable in the, the the sort of rhythms of how each other's going to de deliver things and how to you know how to play off that and and so that was um, uh, you know that was comfortable. It was also in a way it was more comfortable than Peep Show because unlike Peep Show we did actually get to act opposite each other because the way Peep Show was filmed it's, we were always behind one of us was behind a camera we were looking down a camera lens so it was mm -hmm. nice to do some sort of normal comic acting uh, as it were but also obviously there's a lot of for the first series in particular there was a lot of pressure because um, it, it, this is a show in the same genre as Peep Show which had gone down terribly <laughs> well um, which is a nice problem to have but um, but we were thinking, I think all of us were thinking, well, this is definitely going to be compared to Peep Show, and that would be a reasonable comparison for people to make. It's mm -hmm. another dark sitcom on Channel 4, written by someone who wrote uh, uh, several episodes of Peep Show and starring the same two people. They're going to compare it. Um, and Simon's scripts, I think, were brilliant. So we thought, I think this will, I think we'll do okay with that, but that doesn't mean you don't worry tremendously. And that you don't think, you know, the beginning of the first thing, what are they doing standing by a grave? Someone's died. That's not right. They should be in a flat talking to the camera. <laughs> not them being a bit different. Um, uh, so, yeah, that was, you know, so that was the element where the, if, yeah. if, the, if the acting together was a comfortable pair of slippers, that was the slight fear that someone had been sick in one of them. <laughs> <laughs> that was the tax that had to be paid on that great piece of yeah something coming your way um Simon may I ask you mm. you ended the series one now I'm not sure how much spoiling we can give away because it is also available <coughs> on the all, all four platform for anybody who needs to binge manically tomorrow afternoon ahead of mm. series two coming back but it's all going to be there um but clearly left on a bit of a cliffhanger some big mm. things happen to all of these people has it was it always the intention to come back for more with more even when you were planning series one? It was always the intention to come back, I, but I had no idea where it was going to go after that cliffhanger. I'd, oh. it's, it's set up at the end of uh, series one as if I, I'm thinking cleverly, yeah, I know where this is going to go at the, at the start of series two, and I had not a single idea. But it would seem to be a nice way to, to finish it with, uh, with, with Stephen catatonic on, in a chair and... Um, and just it's it seemed right that he'd been driven to the edge of of his sanity by by this lovely guy coming seemingly coming back and just being nice to everybody and but having driven his foster brother you know into uh, into therapy so but i di i didn't i really didn't know where it would go in a in a series two that then we had a few started having meetings about you know what what would happen in series two and then we started to construct it mm -hmm. and what what were some of those influences obviously that they both have taken a bit of a turn in series two from mm. i've seen a couple of sneaky ones um what was your influence was it wanting to keep the mystery surrounding andy wanting to give him <coughs> a, a steer always i i i think he always has to remain schroding as andrew i think he always i think once <laughs> you know for sure whether he is just this this guy coming back to a family where he was very happy or he's satan i think once you know either of those things the, the, you let the air out of the of the, of the setup um so it was um yeah uh, so it was always we always wanted to continue with andrew in that in that vein Mm -hmm. and then have other people obviously reacting to the, yeah and and the, then the, the idea the, was yeah the, it was it, the idea was that maybe in in series two the roles are reversed and if Stephen's been away having some kind of treatment if he comes back um and Andrew is the one in you know in in the pub and he's the sort of boring mundane one and suddenly Stephen feels that he's the exotic one coming back Having spent some time away in in therapy, we thought that was a nice mirror to the to the first series. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Um, I should say, just had a great question come in, so I'm going to store up the questions for uh, towards the end. But please do any questions to the to the our guest this evening. Please pitch them in the the Q and A bit of the Zoom facility, and I will make do my best to squeeze in as many as possible. Just had a very 
interesting one come through. So thank you for that. Um, let's press on though with, um, first of all, series two. Is it a big commitment as actors with multiple projects to sign back on for something like this? Or is it the dream to have a returning successful thing that people want more of? How, how do you balance that? I think the two things are not mutually exclusive. It's it's a dream because it's a big commitment. If you see yeah. It's 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 a good <laughs> it's a good it's a good problem do. right um uh, but yeah you know shooting a uh, a whole series is always uh, quite an intensive few weeks and it's mm -hmm. very it's um you know it's very tiring it's quite stressful particularly stressful if you you know um you you worry about the schedule which I for some reason can't not even though it's not my job um so yeah it's that's it is quite a commitment obviously. Um, this time round didn't go, uh, you know, entirely smoothly. <laughs> so just explain a little bit about that, if you will, just about the, 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 the timeline wise, the disruption that you faced as a project. Well, um, it was, uh, we can, everyone can chip in with this, but we, we had, initially we, we were, we started shooting uh, later than ideally because Simon mm. had been busy with various projects, but nevertheless, quite a while ago, which was last, uh, which was uh, not last uh, October, but the October before that, October 2019, mm -hmm. um, at which point Rob uh, has, as I did, had an insurance medical. Um, uh, Rob, why don't you take up the story? <laughs> Over to Rob. Shall I just tell the story by showing my scar? No, okay. yes. nobody wants to see that. They're just about to have that tea. So anyway, um, uh, it was an insurance medical and normally it's very perfunctory and the doctor just makes you cough and just let's not worry too much about this kind of thing. Uh, but this time he put a stethoscope on my heart and he pulled a face and said, oh dear, what have you been doing about the heart murmur? And I said, what heart murmur? Uh, and then a couple of days later, I had a cardiologist tell me that I had a mitral valve prolapse. Uh, and that it wasn't something that could be fixed with drugs and that I needed uh, surgery. Uh, otherwise, the heart was going to fail in the next two to six months. So that was a bit of a shocker. Um, so I went into that was the day before we were due to start filming. So I did the first week of filming while everybody, the director and producer and various people scrabbled around trying to rearrange the schedule. Uh, and everyone was really nice and very brilliant about it. And then I went and had the operation and they filmed uh, as much as they could. They shot round Andrew um, as much as they could in, in non-Andrew scenes and indeed scenes that Andrew's in, but from clever angles. Uh, director George Kane did a brilliant job like that. Eventually they ran out of stuff to do without me. Uh, so I had the surgery and then took uh, three and a half months to recover. Uh, and then came back, we did another two or three weeks, uh, and then we got quite close to the end and then had to stand down for COVID. Uh, so then that was another big gap between March and September, was it? And then we came back in mm. September 20, did the last eight or nine days, uh, and then finally it was finished. But the continuity is pretty funny. Uh, on my face because you know you've got someone who is clearly very very ill didn't realize how ill he was uh, and then you've got someone who is not ill anymore but pretty knackered and then finally someone who is well whatever you think of this face so it, it's um it's it it tickles me uh, to watch that but try not to think about that when you're watching the show otherwise <laughs> it could be quite distracting of the show you can watch it for the the cop you know, watch it first for the story and then watch it again for the <laughs> Yeah, it's like a DVD extra, really. There should be a, <laughs> there should really be a commentary oh on the state of my health as oh, the things roll by. Oh, well, I'm glad that enough time has passed that you can view this with some, at least some humour. But my goodness, I mean, that must have been a rocky road. I'm not imagining for one minute that anybody on hearing this news thought, but what about back series two? Oh, but I, I did. I mean, this really? is a strange thing that you're, as an actor, you're massively conditioned to not, you know, that the show must go on. And I'm, I was just, uh, you know, I went, I went to work when my wife was in labour with the first, our first 
baby. I mean, I, I got to the hospital eventually, but I did. There are two scenes of Peach Show that I filmed while Abby was in hospital. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I've missed funerals. I've missed weddings. And there's just this, this weird kind of, uh, I, people have been talking about this lately, actually, this weird kind of feeling that, you know, stage and TV acting, you just absolutely cannot miss a day unless you're basically dead. And it took, you know, me having mm-hmm. to have uh, quite serious surgery for me to actually go, I don't really need to, do I need to be here? I don't think I should be here. I'm sort of creeping around the set trying not to have a fucking heart attack. So eventually I, yeah, I did go home, but it's, it's, it's strange that one of my first thoughts on hearing that I needed surgery was like, well, how, how are they going to make it? Well, that doesn't work. How do they, how do they make back? Oh my goodness. That's, that's one of the reasons why show business is such an important refuge for people with various psychological disorders because it get, has the illusion that it matters more than it actually does. <laughs> yeah. Or in a TV show or a play, all these sorts of things. And people mm-hmm. recognize this from doing plays at university or, play, you know, that you think it's the most important thing that ever happened. And that is tremendous escapism because you can forget about all the other things that are more important that are really worrying you. And so it's, it's you know, a great thing about this job. <laughs> You get it out of all proportion, except obviously when what you really need to do is go and have open heart surgery. Oh, um, may I ask you, Robert, has has that day changed that attitude? As you say, you've missed variously important family events. Would you say that it took that to shift the handbrake turn sufficiently to be considered a somewhat more normal person? <clears throat> yeah, definitely. And um, yeah. No, I mean, all you, you sort of notice, it's not like you completely change your attitude to life. That would be just too tiring. Um, mm-hmm. But, you, but you, there are certain things that you thought mattered that clearly don't matter as much as you, as you did. And you, it's not like you go around being constantly enthralled by, you know, the beauty of nature and stopping to smell the flowers. But I think you do, to use the cliche, stop to smell the flowers a bit more often, or I do a bit more often than I, than I did. And I do... You know go oh this oh, that, this pen is actually quite beautiful it's not like i'm gonna do that all the time but i think i think there are times when i, I i'm only talking about mindfulness really but it's mm-hmm. uh, there are certainly more moments of that uh where i you know there's at least a moment like that per day when i'm sort of i'm fairly close to being overcome with uh gratitude for being alive so that's it's a it's a it's a 100 positive thing really well, I'm going to follow that uh, with an equally profound question for Simon, which is, mm. why Stroud? <laughs> <laughs> it was Ben Palmer who who uh, directed the first series and, and the pilot. Um, we were looking at various places and Stroud, I think it was it was it was a kind of it was a filming thing. It was it there was some depth to because you're high up, you can you can shoot people. Um, kind of downhills, and you're seeing this beautiful countryside around them, but they're also in this in this town. So you're getting you're getting a, a you know the town environment, but then you've got this beauty and this depth of field for when you're shooting it. So I think that was I think that was what decided it. I think we were looking around various places closer into London, and they just didn't have enough character. They they were they were too you know, magnetically drawn to London. So we we came out a bit and uh, into the, you know, the Cotswolds and um, yeah and it, it seems it's its own place I think that's it it's a it's a it's a it's a place of its own and it looked beautiful on camera so Ben kind of uh, thought that would be that would be the ideal place. Oh, lovely um, and I was being glib then so I just want to add to that though Robert I really do appreciate you sharing that experience with us because it's incredibly enlightening but obviously it's no small thing. Um, questions come in which obviously I said having said I'll just save them all to the end I think it, it fits in with what we're talking about which is the the setting of the scene and this is really something for all of you so uh, Alexander has asked when reading comedy scripts particularly something like back do you find them amusing even on the page does it leap out at you or do you get absorbed in the technicality and then it's only once you're bringing the script to life that the comedy somehow reveals itself and I guess if we start up the chain with Simon who's in fact creating it do you, can you make yourself laugh or is it is it a mechanical process if if I ever make myself when I'm writing solo if I ever make myself laugh I know that joke is not going to go in the script 
because it's um because it surprised me and therefore it is out, it's it's not in the voice of that script so i sit there and as as com people in comedy often do just going that's funny that works that's funny that's not funny enough that's funny and and um if i ever laugh out loud at something i've written i i think oh well nice but it's not going to go in because it's not um it's it, it's it's outside of the remit of the show because it surprised me and therefore i've laughed um so i just it's a it's a kind of uh it's a, a, i'm not laughing uproariously at stuff i write when i'm writing so if i'm writing you know in a I don't know, say if i was writing with tony roach on on the thick of it then then i'm laughing because we're making each other laugh mm -hmm. but just in me in a room I, it's all quite grim um yeah so one day there'll just be a lovely greatest hits album of all your your thrown away discarded gems that made you laugh and no one else and we'll, we'll yes. have access to it some strange bootleg thing and um, what about I mean, that's your airplane movie is where yes. you yes <laughs> allow all, anything can happen just if it's funny yeah. but you know the queen so walks in and farts <laughs> and then, uh, captain kirk beams into shot and said i'm in the right thing and then a dog dies <laughs> Go on, David. What about you? Do, do you laugh immediately, or is it do you do you have to pour some water on it in in performing it? Um, I I think um, I I think it, when you're reading a script, I find very much in the yes, that's funny, that's funny. Uh, I'm not sure that works. Uh, that's funny. Um, you know that that it's quite dry in the, It's quite rare to to be you know to laugh out loud when you're on your own reading something. Um, mm -hmm. Is is. Uh, um, it's a sort of uh, slightly glum truth. I mean, and, and I think it is quite, even when you're reading, entirely reading for pleasure, a really quite funny book, you, you don't actually make the noise of laughter very often and you, but your brain will have been amused many other times. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I think, I think laughter is something that is quite rare to do uh, without other people there. Um, it's, a, it's a communal thing. You laugh when you're writing with someone else and you laugh, and audiences make lots of laughing noise together if they were watching the same thing uh, on their own they they might they might be just as amused but they won't um acknowledge it um audibly it's weird isn't it because one of those people in that audience has to be the first one to laugh though somebody has to has to be triggered to expel the sound that as you say then creates all that other vibe so somebody's having a, a solitary experience but no, but they, they all know that it is, a, it is the response appropriate to the circumstances. <laughs> no. what, um, about, what about you, um, Robert? Do you, would you say the same thing that it's a, it, it's an, an awareness rather than a kind of a listener or a, con, a consumer's appreciation? I really only read my own lines, so I have no <laughs> idea. About the, I mean, you sort of you sort of go through it, and you you. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think I, I think I giggle sometimes, and definitely just smile and giggle. And then you get if you get to a line that you know that you're doing and that you're looking for, you feel a sort of thrill of excitement, and you kind of go, "Ooh, ooh!" Now then, I'm looking forward to saying that. Um, but it's I wouldn't say that I'm yeah I'm bent double laughing. That usually comes at the first read through, when you you know if you get someone like David or someone like Jeff McGibbon or you know someone funny gets that when they finally get their mouth around this line you see it for the first time and sometimes you know there's a bit of eye contact and we're starting to do a little bit of let's not overdo it it's only a read through but a, a first little bit of acting then then it gets that's when it gets funny and in fact it's probably the only time it is it's the only time that you're going to do much laughing really yeah because by the time you're on set and you've learned your lines and you know, you, you got up very early in the morning, everyone's a little bit tired, you're slightly behind schedule, okay, and the lighting department have done their thing, the camera department and the sound and everything, and, you know, and we're, everyone's kind of, okay, and now we're turning over and now we're filming the scene. It's the, the time for laughter has gone, really, and then you're, you're really <laughs> just doing, you're doing the thing. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the, that first read-through is, is usually where, where most of the actual laughter happens if, if laughter happens on the set then i'm we david and i tend to be quite suspicious because you know what's <laughs> and then if, so this isn't right what's somebody's changed something do it the way we did it the first time it, it, a lot of the craft of it is remembering why you laughed in the first place because you know by the time you're on the third take of the fourth setup you're kind of why was this funny 
<laughs> stupid scene that's going on that we've been doing all afternoon. You have, so you, you have, kind of, it's, yeah, yeah, you just have to remember why you have to. Constantly that the audience is, will be getting this for the first time. And the thing, and there are contexts in which people tinker and change and um, and lose confidence in their own initial confidence that something was funny, mm. uh, and then, and then you get something that, that um, much closer to what Simon says he would laugh at when alone. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Yeah. And, and then, then if, if someone does laugh, then Simon scraps it from the script anyway. Yes. So no laughing. No <laughs> laughing. No <laughs> hugging. Two questions on this. Um, this is a question inspired by a lady called Shrika. Thank you for this. They're, she's wondering how much improvisation goes on because uh, Simon's obviously the writer, but you are both writers. So do, you, do is it done? Is it added and tweaked on the fly, or is it really it comes as a precious, already polished gem? I think se seldom tweaked much. Um, I, I think we, we, don't, we yes, it, we don't mess around with it. Um, I think that sometimes, uh, I think a couple of times in the first series, Simon suggested that we might have a go at improvising the odd line. And I, but that's always after we've shot what's there. And actually, mm -hmm. even in those circumstances, it's more like going and having a bit of a think and a chat about what if I said this, what if I said that, rather than just actually making it up as you go along. It's, that's just you know going into a corner and making it up at the last minute, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. I get the feeling that Simon working on other shows, like with Armando, is quite keen on, you know, you do, mm. you do, you get the, you get what you've got in the script and you go, okay, let's put the script to one side and now let's sort of, um, uh, I nearly said freak, let's all freak out. Let's all freak <laughs> out anyone, he's that kind of guy. Um, whereas the, that approach has never really been, there was a bit of that on, yeah, as David says, on the first series, but because mm. the, the filming of the second series was, as I described, so tortuous that we were mm. always kind of, oh my God, either somebody's having a heart attack or somebody's having, or there's a pandemic. And so it's the, there's never really a moment for, let's just kind of free <laughs> form everyone. It, yeah. was kind of, it was just, oh my God, get the, stand there. That's where you need to stand and say <laughs> that line. We've got every other word in this sentence in the can. Yeah. You just stand there. <laughs> the sun needs to be shining. You've got the water in one hand and you need to say... And. <laughs> <laughs> and Simon, let's have your hmm. side of this, side of affairs. So do you, do you feel quite uh, attached and proprietorial over the words? No, I, I don't just because uh, coming out of the school of Armando Inucci really in that, you know, having done the thick of it and in the loop and veep where we encourage kind of we 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 always we would always shoot the script but then we would we would do looser takes um and often what you would get from that is you would get a look uh from an actor that 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 was better than the line the look said you know, the look did what the line was meant to do and so you would put that in so it was just for the edit if you had this kind of rougher looser take then that could be useful just to make it feel more real and I mean it's always with everything I do I want it to feel real um and so if if on back something is is feeling uh that it doesn't kind of quite rhythmically fit um with that performer then then you can change it on the on the fly but it's this is a more scripted thing than than the stuff as Rob was saying than the stuff I, I used to do with Armando because um but but still, it it's feeling real is is the is the watchword. We it's got to you've got you've got to believe it uh, as an audience member. You've got to believe it. It matters dramatically. The bones. Um, Jean Buchanan has um, helpfully suggested that you laughing as you write your scripts and then chucking them out says this is is this close to Dr. Johnson's choose three passages which you think particularly fine and strike them out. Did you know you were being Johnsonian? Well, that's. I'm very pleased to be compared to Dr. Johnson. That's, <laughs> I, 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 surprisingly, I never have been before. So it's <laughs> there you that's go. very Go with that. Um, now, I'm sorry, this is so boring. This I'm sure you've been asked a million times, but um, you clearly, it's, I mean, I think it's just an achievement just to still be talking to each other after all these years, let alone creating things together and making each other laugh. Take me back, take us all back to your first encounter, university days. Did you make each other laugh then was 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 that that gem in place from the very first time or was it was it a grower 
Yes, we met um, doing an audition for, uh, no, it wasn't an audition, we'd already been cast, but doing a sort of group, little small group rehearsal thing for a for Footlights comedy panto. Um, and uh, and we were in that show. We didn't really spend much time with each other during that show, but a few months later, we were both writing for a review, uh, writing sketches, and we wrote together for the first time. And it was a terrible sketch, uh, called War Farce, uh, where there was a sort of, um, uh, what's his name, David? Um, the sort of farcy kind of, duh, 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 oh no, kind of actor. Ray, Ray Cooney? It was a, some kind of Ray. It was a Ray I, type. I think, I think we had, we were probably not completely on top of the material we were satirizing. <laughs> <laughs> no, we uh, the fact that I can't even remember who yeah, we were sat around. Anyway, uh, but the thing was, it, when we read it out to the rest of the group, it completely died. But we had a brilliant time writing it uh, and uh, really made each other laugh. And I think that's been the important thing is that we laugh at the same things, that the same things amuse us and that we meet, we amuse each other. Uh, and that's been a very strong part of um, part of what kept us going, I think. Mm. And David, what would you add to that? Or dispute? No, well, I, I, I would uh, factually, initially, it was a rehearsal. It, uh, no, it was a, an audition. It was a recall audition for oh. the, the oh. pantomime. So it was a bit like, yeah, let's, let's rehearse, let's put it on its feet a bit. So it, was a bit, it had a different vibe. But I remember, very clearly remember thinking uh, how funny Rob was uh, from that uh, and from the subsequent show. Um, and yes, I, th I think we, we've, we've always been on, I mean, it's a sort of cliche phrase, but on the same comic wavelength, and yet we don't come across like we're necessarily going to be. And I think that's been a, a key thing that we, we've always found the same things funny. We have the same comic rhythm, uh, but we have different uh, contrasting personas. Uh, so we, we um, it always, well, the first show we did together, just the two of us on stage, um, where we were horrendously, un I mean, to say we were under rehearsed would be to imply there had been any rehearsal. Um, uh, and we would sort of, we'd written a script that we could sort of half remember, and we just sort of did it together on stage. And it went really well, which is a terrible lesson and a great lesson at the same time. And it showed that we, ha we did have a very complementary chemistry. We really enjoyed it. It was an amazing night. Uh, but we, we also thought we could get away without um, rehearsing properly, which subsequent occasions showed us not always to be the case. <laughs> I see. And what, Simon, what can you remember your first meeting with these two? Well, I th we were on various, as I remember it, sort of about 20 years ago, we, there were various shows on BBC Choice that I did, I wrote for, and I didn't have digital TV at the time, so I never saw them, so I can't <laughs> remember what they were. But I, I, we, we, we were in various writers' rooms, and I know we were on, we were all together on the, uh, on the last series of the Eleven O'clock Show, whenever that was, two thousand and two. Last something. series of the Eleven O'clock Show. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember. I know exactly when it was because I was. Uh, I went to the office of the Eleven O'clock Show on the morning after the presidential election that um, in the end, George W. Bush won. 2000. Right. Yeah, 2000, yeah. okay. Yeah. okay. Autumn 2000. That was okay. Yeah. So yeah, so it was then, and then various digital TV shows that I've never seen that I think we were all kind of drafted in to do jokes and sketches and items. I remember that people did items on these shows, but that were neither, they're just, Things that was light-hearted and humorous, but not necessarily. Did, David and I did a David and I did a show, and I think you were one of those shows. That I think you were in the room. It was Jeremy Vine presenting a show. Yes. Called <laughs> the funny side of Seven Days, or the yeah. funny side of the week, or some yes. title that was just extraordinary. Some title that had clearly been through various quite political yes. committees. <laughs> yeah. But, oh my. No, I, yes, I, I definitely did write for Jeremy Vine <laughs> in the early days, yeah. <laughs> so, um, Simon, until these two, this pair crossed your path, who yeah. would you say has been your favourite, obviously present company accepted, um, comedy duo, a sort of that, that equivalent? Because you do walk in quite hallowed steps. Who, who would you say really shares that, a similar, lovely, dynamic chemistry? Uh, um, well, I think Morgan and Wise spring to mind first because it's um, 
because they were so funny, but there was also such affection towards them. Uh, people, people, you know, audiences uh, love them and they love to see them on the screen together. So it's, I mean, they're the ones, for me growing up, I was, you know, I, I, I loved pieces and um, yeah. And, and, but just kind of comic actor pairings as well, you know, just um, Richard Beckinsale and Ronnie Barker in Porridge, for instance, is a wonderful double act of two brilliant, not comedians, but fantastic comic actors mm -hmm. you know, who had some of the best scripts ever written by, you know, two of the best comedy writers. So, um, yeah. That's a great double act. I think writing in double acts is the, um, that, that's what happens in back actually is, is rather than thinking of the ensemble, it's it's much better to think in terms of various double acts and then seeing who and who can we have together in this scene and, and what would be funny about those two characters being together. Well, funnily enough, we have a question on another character from Nikki McDermott Rowe, and she's asking, was it as fun to write Jeff's lines as it was to listen to them? And was there an inspiration behind his character? So could you just very swiftly um, explain who Jeff is for people who haven't seen the show? Jeff is, um, so Stephen's father, Laurie, and, um, and, and who uh, fostered Andrew, uh, he has a, a younger brother called, uh, no, what was he? Yeah, he is younger. He is called Jeff, who's a local farmer. And um, he's he's uh, he doesn't particularly have a filter, and so he uh, and he's a it's a very useful thing comedically to have a character like that who can just come in like a firework and and be funny, and and uh, and make other make the people in the show laugh as well. That's you know he's allowed to people are allowed you know in the world of the show to laugh at what Jeff says. Um, so it is it's nice to do Jeff's lines, and it's. Um, you know, he yeah, he can just you can use him as a sort of as a as a bit of dynamite to come in, particularly if there's a scene where you need to get some ex exposition out. Um, you know, one of the sweariest lines in the in the first episode um, uh, of the first series that Jeff says that people often quote as a as their favorite line from the show. It's it's there to get a big laugh because it covers a massive piece of exposition really massive piece of exposition and the, one of the things you try to do with big pieces of exposition is hide them behind as big a laugh as you can mm -hmm. um so he's uh, yeah it's 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 fun to it's fun to write everyone but it's he's and jeff mcgiven is a genius as, and has been doing fantastic stuff for 45 years or however long it is so um it's a it's a privilege to write for him now is this i don't know what is that line just you can tell us um Okay, it was. Uh, he's uh, he's talking about the setup for his uh, his wireless speaker, and that's we need to know for the for the at the end of the show. Oh yes. that there is there is a wireless speaker. So I don't think I need to go into the. No, I've remembered it. <laughs> into the dialogue, but yes. yes, but we need to set up absolutely for the culmination <laughs> of the show. We need to know there's a wireless speaker that Jeff has set up, and that's a yes. big bit of dull exposition. So it's hidden behind that particular joke. Worth the price of admission alone. Um, I had a, 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 qu a similar question on one line from Kelly. This is a question for you as well, Simon. And this mm. is, you massive effing orphan has to be Kelly's favorite line ever, apparently. So um, just, so, just so taboo and delivered so brilliantly, will, I guess the question leading into, will it ever be too soon? This is gonna take us into a big discussion about contemporary comedy. Will it, will it be too soon for COVID based humor? Are there subjects that are that are kind of sweet in the sweet spot of being a bit naughty but not taboo, and then knowing how do you how do you draw where the line is as a writer? I th I think you you always it's a on a case by case basis, and it, it has to be. You have to use your judgment as mm -hmm. to whether something is funny, whether it's whether it's worthwhile. I think in that moment, the, you you massive effing orphan. I think it's. Stephen's reaching for the cruelest thing he can say mm -hmm. in that it's a it's at a, a it's at a point of high emotion and I think he's reaching out to find something that would pierce Andrew's armor mm -hmm. and it doesn't it is a very <laughs> cruel thing and it just bounces off Andrew he doesn't it, he doesn't flinch but it's yeah it's it's Stephen reaching for the worst thing he can say and in that moment calling him an orphan he's he's wanting to hurt him and but he he doesn't and it shows his kind of 
impotence in that moment and it also shows Andrew's strength and that he can't be you know he can't be phased yeah hide of a rhino oh yes it does a lot mm. doesn't it it's it's horribly nor just yeah disturbing and very yeah. funny as a result I guess all right let's let's do it let's talk about Trump yay I got this far um so obviously today um Simon let's start with you in the wait you've mm. written thick of it you've written veep um recent events is there any, is there a lot of, is there black humour to be dug at with a trowel with what we've seen recently? Uh, I don't know whether I could find it. I've been very pleased the last few years. I haven't had to write about politics, either British politics or American politics, because it's, I, in 2016, um, well, I, I always felt with, 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 with Think of It and Veep, there's, there's a facade of competence uh, and then there's a kind of the chaos behind that and 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 the, the space in between is where you find the comedy but in 2016 the facade fell away and and all and you just saw the chaos and I'm not sure I could find where the comedy is the extremes Trump went to I'm not sure where you then comedically go um, and I'm very happy I haven't had to to, to try and do that the last few years that's really interesting so he, he didn't leave you enough that, as the no, comedy writer enough space yeah there was no room to, yeah. to find the comedy because he was he was going to the extremes that you might go comedically and he was going beyond those i mean in, in veep we would have you know julia's character would make this the slightest kind of gaff in a speech and it would be this an enormous mm -hmm. uh this enormous thing and then you have when he was running for president, you have you have Trump on live TV making fun of a journalist with cerebral palsy, and getting no, you know, just get, getting more praise from his from his base. And then mm -hmm. I I thought, well, where there's nowhere to there's nowhere to go with this with an individual that extreme. It's very mm -hmm. difficult because almost all of the sort of great. Um, political comedy, whether it's the thick of it or Yes Minister, and that's a, there's a big, thick seam of embarrassment that mm. create these mm. figures, and they're not everything that they claim to be, and they're easily embarrassed. And yeah. Trump is, is but basically unembarrassable. He's embarrassable mm. only on the same level you could embarrass a, an angry two-year-old. So yeah. without that human strain of embarrassment, a lot of the comedy closes down. But the other thing, and this is to give Trump credit, he is funny himself he doesn't mean to be funny but what he is doing is directly and immediately funny that's not something you can say about Dominic Raab Dominic Raab is extremely <laughs> boring to watch and so you need a lot of satirical work drawing out any comedy from him but Trump is pretty much doing it himself to start with he's going to the extremes he's being ridiculous he's being watchable and so a lot of the comedy about Trump has just been essentially quoting Trump or mouthing what Trump says because he's already done it now obviously that one of the things that spoils that joke is that it's really happening. And so, it's, <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's no comfort to be found from it. There's no feeling of strength to be found from the mockery because he's clearly, there he is, mocking himself by his own ridiculousness and not suffering on any level as a result. Mm. And, you know, until fortunately being voted out. But uh, so it was, it's all really, uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult for, uh, for satirical comedy. Um, and it's and you know because um, but, but but at least you can watch him and he is funny. Mm. He's just he is funny and watchable and magnetic and lots of you know and and now hopefully we can enjoy that more now he's not in power. Um, <laughs> so it's like funny minus escapism equals exactly, trouble. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, question for um, David and Robert. So I think I think I even read now, Robert, you can confirm if this is true, or if it was a nice line at the time or just how you were thinking, which was that you saw yourself more because you've had success now with your memoir and recently your novel, that you see yourself primarily as an author. Would you agree with that? Does that stick? No, I, I, that's the kind of thing I can imagine myself saying. Um, <laughs> you did I, one I, day. Yes. I, I would like to hastily backtrack. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't I don't really have a it's kind of depends what you're what you're doing at the time at the moment I'm very busily writing uh, 
uh, sorry, I'm very busily not writing my second novel, what they will surely one day call my second novel. I did actually, I, there, are, there, are, there are about 230 words about somebody hiding in a caravan. I think, I think the main character has to be hiding. The, first, the main character in Come Again is hiding as well, it's kind of sh showing herself off from the world. This is clearly my state of mind at the beginning of a two year writing <laughs> project, <laughs> hiding <laughs> and going, oh God, everybody go away. Um, so I've, I've started, but, um, uh, but yeah, no, I, I'm never going to stop acting because I, I enjoy it too much. I am getting fussier. It's true. And I'm, you know, it's brilliant to work with David and it's brilliant to work with scripts as good as mm -hmm. Simon's, but they don't come along all that often. So, um, I, I do bits and bobs. I can imagine getting back on stage again. That would be great. I mean, there are certain things I've been turning down because I, I had not a premonition exactly, but I, I sort of knew without quite knowing that I I wasn't fit enough to do, for example, a 12-week run or just mm. one press night uh, on the on the in the West End because I knew I was I was kind of ill. So um, it would be nice to go back to that certainly. But um, uh, no, I, I I don't see myself primarily as a novelist. And but the paperback of Come Again is out at the end of April. <laughs> At which point you will be a novelist only, <laughs> again. Right. In which case, you know, I'll be saying, oh, yeah, anybody can act, but this is the difficult <laughs> stuff. And actually what Simon said really unnerved me because he was talking about uh, if it makes him laugh, then he, he has to say, well, that's nice, but I, it can't go in the script. I really only put in jokes that make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably why my novel is just all over the place. But uh, <laughs> anyway, and indeed the, the, the sad bits I don't go in unless they actually make me cry. So, you know, my writing process is this disgusting emotional mess uh, that I'm glad nobody filmed. <laughs> to great commercial success, we should add at this point. I, if you yeah, thank, yes. Um, David, how, how difficult or easy is acting compared with being a panel show, well, sort of co-host of one of the, the most successful panel shows of our era? Um, I, well, it, it's, I think, I mean, it, again, it sort of depends. They're both, when they're going well, they're both easy. And, and, and <laughs> that's the, the, the thing about uh, acting. And I think uh, is that if, if, you're, if you're doing it right, it's coming very naturally. And, and, I, and I think one of the traps that actors fall into is thinking that that this should feel like hard work and that's why some actors give themselves a lot of homework that they don't need to do in terms of immersion in the characters and that sort of thing but certainly comedically when a when a script is flowing it, you know it shouldn't be hard to say it's boring to learn but that's not difficult that just takes time and sort of similarly with a panel show that that, uh, that if you're in the right format and with the right audience and in the right mood then it's just coming. And uh, uh, and so, you know, a lot of the work is engendering the circumstances where it is then easy um, and keeping the confidence up and, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, being, th being the right person in the right place at the right time. Right. Um, and yeah. it was very different from a lot, a lot of people, it always slightly intimidates me that people talk in a lot of interviews about the tremendous sort of pain and struggle of their creative processes and they've created great stuff that's certain that's not what I would say is my feeling in terms of performing I was saying it, fe it feels great and if it doesn't feel great then it's not going well mm -hmm. uh, okay. now, in fact well, it was one of the things I was, when I did the upstart uh, upstart crow in the west end which was uh, closed down by the lockdown and it was my first west end show and it was going well it was really good fun but my one thing in the process that I uh balked at is that was somebody came in to sort of work on our voices and that sort of thing in the rehearsal and obviously I was horrendously skeptical about this to start with but um so I was not giving this person a fair hearing but then nevertheless we were doing this thing we we're making weird noises going around I'm thinking I've got lines to learn we haven't blocked scene 12 but anyway um he's doing you know and he said <laughs> He said, if it doesn't feel embarrassing, you're not doing it right. Oh, fuck <laughs> off. And, and I, and I, yeah, what I didn't say to him is, listen, all I, I can't play the oboe, I can't dance, I can't sing. All I've got in this business <laughs> is my sense of what is shit. And that's all I, that I have no defence. You know, you're not going to pay my pension, sunshine. So... <laughs> 
<laughs> if it feels shit and there's an audience watching, stop. That's, you know, I didn't say that to him. I went along with it. <laughs> the next time he comes, I'm busy. Nice. Yeah, that's the David Mitchell school of school of acting. It's all, it's all you've got. You've got working with an all You just think it's live. You've got to feel confident. You've got to feel like it's going well. But also, if, if it feels terrible, it's only you. Don't stop. Don't trust anyone. <laughs> Those trust games, they're a trap. You're on your own. <laughs> hey, listen, um, we are running out of time, but I've got a handful of questions. So I'm going to try and squeeze just a few more in before we disappear. Um, this may or may not be a trick question. I hear big talk productions are excellent to work with. Any thoughts? Who wants to take that? I believe they are the company behind back. So uh, do you feel I would gladly sell my house and give all of the money to Kent and Allen of Big Talk Productions. Oh, that was a that was a question from a man called Kent. <laughs> yeah. They are excellent to work with and tremendously supportive and uh, and you know and uh, well done, Kenton. Kenton has stayed on this project the whole time, and yeah. has, has been a tremendous. Uh, um, force for making it happen um, and it, it, you know he is so uh, very nice to me they bought me some pajamas and some headphones uh, for me to take to hospital bless them but yes i'm a big fan of big talk in fact i'm going to buy kenton a small plant uh, that he can keep <laughs> in his office by way of gratitude and kenton would have done the open heart surgery if asked yeah. there's no he, doubt he, he, yes absolutely he'd have had a go he'd at least have shaved me yeah <laughs> <laughs> can't say that for many can you um so right well, let's not talk about the frustrations of of creative people during lockdown because i feel that would be unseemly compared with so many other people let's let's talk about your consolations how where have you found the consolations of lockdown simon let's start with you um my consolations for the first lockdown uh, back in march was that our uh, two adult sons came back home to live with us and um, I didn't think when they left home that we would ever have that amount of family time again together, you know, four of us as a unit. Maybe we'd go on holiday if people were free, but, but otherwise that was, that was us done as a family unit. And so they came back and the sun was shining and it was, uh, that was a, a lovely consolation to be able to spend some time with, with my sons. Fantastic. Robert, what about you? I'm very unsociable, so it's been brilliant to have an excuse not to have to go and <laughs> see people. Uh, uh, I also have two children who are a little bit younger and um, we're doing homeschooling at the moment, which, you know, a lot of the time is it's just IT support and it can be quite frustrating. But um, uh, there again, I am seeing a lot more of them than I than I would if there was a, they were at school and they're, they seem quite happy. So it's uh, it's nice like that. I've done a lot more reading. Um, than I usually do. So, uh, yeah, so I quite like being at home. So I'm, I must have so, so touched so far. I, I'm having a brilliant pandemic. There we go. Um, what's about you, David? Well, I, I, I've not, I wish it hadn't happened. I mean, I will say that. Mm -hmm. I mean, but the same time, <laughs> I've just been fine, really. And I, and I think mainly none of my family have got ill. That's, you know, that's tremendous news. Um, and we've, you know, we've been perfectly happy tucked away here. And, uh, but I, but a lot of my thoughts during it have been focused on the fact that it will end. So that's, you know, that's, you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not in a place of saying, do you know what, this is actually nicer than normal life. I'm no. not, I, I, I'm happy for normal life to come back, but it's been fine. Okay, and um, final question, what will be the thing that each of you dashes out to do come that day when the drawbridge goes back down and the trellis goes up? What will be the thing? What, Simon, what, what, will you hang, what have you hankered for that you will rush to, to replicate? Um, I, think, I think eating out, I think eating somewhere other than your own kitchen mm -hmm. is, uh, I'm gonna look forward to, to doing that a lot. Uh, when this when this war is over mm -hmm. and Robert would you say that or? I would also like a really big lunch with at least six friends that would be great within legal guidelines uh, just the six Saturday lunchtime in a gastro pub with six funny nice people mm -hmm. David any advances on that 
Cer certainly uh, eating in a restaurant. Who invited you? Going, going, <laughs> going to the seaside. I like that. Um, and yes, I think restaurants and the seaside. And yeah, going to stay in a hotel. I'd like that. Yeah. I want all of it. I want all of it back. <laughs> <laughs> None of it too grasping, is it? It's simple pleasures, but in the mm. meantime, we do have our tellies, and um, the pair of you will be on screen tomorrow evening after your one show, your tour, your final tour of duty, um, and so we can look forward to series two of Back, and we should say that all of series one is available on the all four platforms, so you can binge or you can um, ration it out for the rest of lockdown, however long that may be. But all that remains for me is to thank everyone for joining us this evening for tuning in on the zoom we're you know reaching that tiny or tiny but like final muscle of zoom fatigue and the three of you for being so generous with your time and chatting about this project with us tonight many appreciations thank you thanks, thanks.